Well, welcome to 10 Minute Record Reviews, episode 365. And this time I'm going to talk about this record, which came out on Prestige in 1960 by the John Wright trio, Southside Soul. This particular version is a 1990 original jazz classics release. The original, in fact, the first few pressings are incredibly hard to find. In terms of what to expect, well, this is a bluesy piano trio, one of the classic bluesy piano trios. In its leader, John Wright, you have a character who's a bit unusual in the world of jazz because despite the fact that he recorded five records as a leader for a well-known label, Prestige, in the early 1960s, he recorded with barely anybody else. And in fact, his sidemen didn't record with anybody else in their entire careers. So these guys basically have their time in the sun, last for about two years, and then it's done. This is their moment. John Wright was born in September 1934 in either Mount Juliet, Tennessee, or Louisville, Kentucky, depending on what you read. But he didn't live for long in the South, principally because his dad was a fugitive from justice. By his own account, he apparently had killed 14 people. Anyway, he changed his name from Washington to Wright, and the family moved to Chicago when John was two. The family settled on the South Side, they bought a piano, and by the age of three, the precocious talent that was John was already picking out tunes and by age seven, he's accompanying his mother at church. Like so many American artists, the church was a real crucible for his talent, and an interest in jazz soon followed, but his mother, being quite strictly religious, wouldn't let any of that jazz or other vice into the house, so he had to sneak out late at night and sneak into jazz clubs to hear this music. In doing so, he forms a musical bond with a guy called Jody Christian, who is also a piano player, and who would go on to a pretty substantial career as a sideman and as a regular feature of Eddie Harris's groups in the late 60s and early 70s. Wright and Christian began jamming in the clubs, and Wright found himself really smitten by the lifestyle. As he said, I made myself a vow. I was going to play jazz, I was going to drink plenty of whiskey, and I was going to chase pretty women. But notwithstanding the obvious appeal of these jazz clubs to a young man, in 1952, John Wright and a bunch of his friends from Wendell Phillips High School in Chicago dropped out of high school, didn't finish their senior year, and enlisted with the idea of being sent to Korea. But only Wright's friends were sent to Korea. He himself was sent to the European theater, and by theater, quite literally, it was a theater because he ended up playing in a lot of army bands in England, in Germany, in Italy. It turns out to be quite fortuitous because most of the other guys who signed up with him actually did get sent to Korea, as I mentioned, and many of them were killed. For Wright, his military musical career was, notwithstanding his early jamming in jazz clubs, his real apprenticeship because he got a chance to play with all kinds of folks who were serious musicians who'd found their way into the forces. He had a lot of natural talent. He basically faked it until he made it. And he also, as well as the piano, picked up the bass. After three years of this, he'd gotten accustomed to living in Europe and was quite happy to make that his permanent location. He got engaged to a girl in Germany. But just at that point, 1955, his mother finds out he has fathered a child in Chicago before he left to go into the army. So she insists that he comes back to Chicago, which he dutifully does, all credit to him. And compared to the callow youth who had left Chicago and enlisted in the army, he was now returning as a fairly seasoned performer, and it was relatively easy for him to find work. His first regular paying engagement was at a club called the Randolph Rendezvous, where he was playing for a drummer and a band leader by the name of Jelly Holt. Holt was an R&B mainstay in Chicago who had a sideline playing jazz for fancy people in fancy hotels because it paid well. During this period in the late 1950s, Wright also starts playing with his own trio in and around clubs in Chicago, including the bass player Wendell Roberts, who appears on this record. Now, Roberts is roughly the same age as Wright, and he did serve in Korea, whether he was part of that group of high school friends who signed up, the historical record is silent. Whether or not he was, he learned to play the bass in Korea, and he hooked up with Wright sometime around 1956. 1957. The drummer is a guy called Walter McCants, who's a bit older than both Wright and Roberts. He'd been playing in Chicago for a number of years by the time that Wright got out of the army, including an early version of the Ramsey Lewis Trio, although he would have been out and Red Holt in on drums by 1956 at the latest before that group went on to find the success that it did. Anyway, whether it was in this trio setting or the other work that Wright was doing in hotels with people like Jelly Holt, he began to attract attention, including the attention of scouts from Prestige Records and the A&R guy, Esmond Edwards, who had taken over A&R duties and production duties from Bob Weinstock in the recent past. In the middle of August 1960, a rep from Prestige Records approaches Wright in Chicago and offers him and his trio 
air tickets to fly to New York to make a record. So off they went to New York, or more specifically, New Jersey, and Prestige were pretty high on Wright's prospects because he seemed to embody to them a kind of soulful jazz which would end up being really the bulk of that label's output in the 1960s. So they signed him to a multi-record deal, and in rapid succession, he makes five records for them in two years. Those include his debut, Southside Soul, from 1960, Nice and Tasty, from later in that same fall, Making Out in 1961, Mr. Soul in 1962, and The Last Amen, which was recorded in 1961, but not released until 1965. So things were pretty well set up for Wright with his talent and with this deal to go on to be a regular recording artist for prestige in the rest of the decade. However, this degree of success did nothing to deter him from fulfilling one of the key aspects of his youthful aspirations regarding jazz, and that was drinking lots of whiskey, which he did in abundance. He was missing gigs, he became unreliable, he was dropped by the label, and he found it hard by the mid-1960s to get work anywhere outside of his own original network in Chicago, which is where he found himself by about 1965, basically just getting by for the next couple of decades. Eventually, he gets things sorted out, joins AA, gets his life back on the rails in the mid-1980s, gets a job as a librarian at none other than the Cook County Jail, and from that point on, being in semi-retirement, he continued to enjoy the fruits of being a minor institution in the city of Chicago. He does put out one more record in 1994 under his own name. That's the release Changes and Choices put out on the Norma label. This record is made at the end of August 1960 in Rudy Van Gilder's still new recording studio in Inglewood Cliffs, New Jersey, with Esmond Edwards in the producer's chair. As I mentioned earlier, Edwards had recently taken over both A&R and production duties in the main from Weinstock. He also took this photo and designed the cover. Now, you can read that Wright basically improvised this whole record in the studio. In fact, there are latter-day interviews where he basically suggests as much. There's probably something to that, obviously, as five of the seven tracks are originals, either written by Roberts or by Wright or by Esmond Edwards. And all the tracks have names which evoke different parts of Chicago and fit neatly with the theme of the album, which also suggests they might have been written on the spot. But there are also two compositions by Armand Jump Jackson, who was a drummer and a band leader who achieved a degree of post-war fame in Chicago. And as this was Wright's working trio, it's almost certain, I think, that the Jackson pieces were part of their regular repertoire. So I would think as well that some of the other pieces, although they might have been finalized in the studio, were certainly bits they had been working through in their live dates leading up to this session. Side one starts with the title track, South Side Soul, which is written by Esmond Edwards. Unlike many, if not all, of the tracks on here, it's a 12-bar blues. It's slow and sultry. It's notable for Walter McCant's thunderous drum fills. And Roberts has a bass solo here stays pretty close to the beaten path. Next is 47th and Calumet, which is written by John Wright. This is an even slower blues. It's given emotional weight by Wright's percussive, sustained heavy piano. LaSalle After Hours is the first of the two Armand Jackson compositions. The idea of this track is to give the feeling of the Chicago business district after everyone's gone home, all the white collar workers have gone home and the creatures of the night have made their appearance and it does that very well. The side ends with an up-tempo track, 63rd and Cottage Grove, and on this track I think you can hear a lot of evidence of Wright having spent at least some of his formative years accompanying a Baptist choir. Side 2 begins with 35th Street Blues, which is by the bassist Wendell Roberts, the first of two compositions by him, and this is a gorgeous ballad. The record ends with diametrically opposed corner songs, Sing Corner, followed by Amen Corner. Sing Corner is an Armin Jackson track, the second of his two on here, similar to the first one has a lot of energy. The closer Amen Corner is by Roberts, his second composition, and like the closer on side one, it is very easy to imagine the accompaniment to a Baptist choir in full voice. This is a charming record. Through slow numbers and fast numbers, Wright is uniformly excellent. McCant's drumming adds a lot of needed dynamism and variety. You've always got the challenge in a trio record. It's a concept record of sorts, but whether or not you get the associations between the Chicago neighborhoods and streets and the music, the music stands on its own. The record succeeds by staying within itself. If you see it, buy it if you can. And for me, it's four and a half out of five stars.